Driverless cars will finally solve the problem of moving people around with maximum efficiency by ceding human control to computers. They promise to bring a messy, dangerous domain of life under control at last. Traffic jams will likely become a thing of the past and accidents will be greatly reduced. So we're told at any rate. In this we can detect a familiar pattern. Driverless cars are one instance of a wider shift in our relationship to the physical world in which the demands of competence give way to a promise of safety and convenience. The skilled practitioner becomes a passive beneficiary of something more systemic, rendering his skill obsolete. <clears throat> Human beings are terrible drivers. That is the refrain. It's hard to disagree. The windshield begins to seem like one more screen, and it can't compete with the dopamine candy offered on the other screens. So now Silicon Valley is going to solve the problem of distracted driving that it helped to create by removing us from the driver's seat. And perhaps that's a good thing on balance, given the realities. But it also represents a quiet coup of some consequence. Yeah. And we do well to pause and consider the direction we're headed. <clears throat> we catch a glimpse of one possible future in the animated film WALL-E, in which we see grotesquely <coughs> fat people ferried about a hovering grid in their car-like pods. Finally relieved of the burden of paying attention to their surroundings, they slurp from enormous cup holders and gaze raptly at their screens untroubled by the over-determination of their world. Their faces beam in a slackened sort of way with the opiate pleasures of novelties piped into their cockpits from afar. These beings are completely safe and content and somehow less than human. The scene is powerful because it presents an image in which we already recognize ourselves with a shock of aesthetic revulsion. Is this revulsion merely aesthetic? Or does it offer us an affective cue that there may be something important at stake? A threat of human degradation that we should try to clarify. <clears throat> and if that's the case, what is the positive possibility that is absent or diminished in this dystopian automotive picture? What's so great about driving? That's the animating question of the book, and in trying to answer it, I attempt something like philosophical anthropology. For driving is a rich and varied practice, as with any such practice, a full consideration of it can focus light of a particular hue on what it means to be human. It can also shed light on the challenge of remaining human against technologies that tend to enervate and claim cultural authority in doing so. The boosters of driverless cars are unimpressed with pleasure as an ideal and suspicious of individual judgment. For self-driving cars to realize their full potential to reduce traffic and accidents, we can't have rogue dissidents bypassing the system of coordination that they make possible. Their inherent logic presses toward their becoming mandatory. If our fate is to be that of passengers, Let's first understand what we're being asked to give up. When we've learned to walk, we've only just begun <clears throat> our journey toward full mobility in the world of artifacts, as there remain to be mastered all those modes of movement that extend and transform our native powers, from bicycles to hoverboards. When a person is depressed, he lets himself be carried along by life indifferently, like a passenger. And conversely, there seems to be an inherent connection between movement and joy. So I have a young dog, and she goes tearing around the yard gratuitously, making these sharp cuts and great looping circles for no apparent reason. She's blisteringly fast, she knows it, and these eruptions seem both to express her joy and to cause it. Lucy has a definite need for speed. Elsewhere in the front yard, my daughter Jo spends hours on a 30-foot rope swing, 
having hit upon a technique that requires no adult to push her. She pushes off from the massive oak tree with her feet <coughs> and does these big arcing uh, loops that bring her back to the tree at a tangent. And in the course of these arcs, she spins either fast or slow, according to whether she's extended her legs or not. <coughs> she's learned the conservation of angular momentum and always meets the tree feet first, ready to push off again. Children have a knack for finding affordances in their environment that give them new avenues of movement and joy. When we get a little older, we begin to notice how a new avenue might be opened up if we alter the environment, for example, by stringing a rope up on a tree, or by adding wheels. <clears throat> now we're talking. So Josephine's first wheeled conveyance was a scooter. So I used a, a bike to accompany her on her first excursions beyond the driveway. So with the graveness that only children are capable of, she pushed off onto the gentle slope that runs away from our house. While muttering warnings to herself about various hazards in the broken pavement and occasional yelps of fright, by the third or fourth such excursion, she had it wired. Wind in her hair, she must have sensed my own joy alongside her and reckoned it worth breaking her concentration on the pavement, just long enough to shoot me a glance of grinning pride. A pogo stick followed, and soon enough came mastery of that ultimate childhood conveyance, a bicycle. Her need for speed has developed a pace with each breakthrough of her expanding mobility. As Nietzsche said, joy is the feeling of one's powers increasing. <clears throat> Combine that thought with another. Aristotle said that what distinguishes animals from the rest of nature is that we are self-moving, <clears throat> unlike a rock. We get up and go often for no good reason. Aristotle may have been onto something, as we're now learning that self-locomotion, as distinct from being carried passively, is tied to the development of our higher capacities. Navigating space and exploring our environment influence how the hippocampus develops, and this structure at the center of the brain is where we develop our cognitive maps of the world. We have specialized cells dedicated to place, others that specialize in head direction, and grid cells that are activated by movement as we roam through an environment, allowing us to build a coordinate system for navigating. But it gets more interesting still. Self-mobility appears to be deeply implicated in the development of episodic memory. So our cognitive maps of space are the locus of our memories of the past. And that makes sense. Events always happen in some place. Time and space are connected in experience and therefore also in memory. And it's only after the brain becomes capable of place learning through the slow development of the hippocampus via roaming self-locomotion that we begin to retain episodic memories. Um, there are some psychologists that hypothesize that this mutual dependence of movement and memory may explain why we don't remember our earliest childhood. They note that infantile amnesia starts to dissipate when children begin crawling and walking. Once babies begin moving through space rather than being carried passively, the brain's place cells and grid cells start firing and aligning themselves to the environment, encoding the spaces being explored and ultimately building the scaffolding of episodic memory. <clears throat> now consider, our episodic memories provide the dots that we connect to tell stories about ourselves. Now we're getting into the territory of the distinctly human. We don't simply exist like an animal that lives entirely in the present. We interpret our existence. We do so by composing a narrative that makes sense of our past and provides a basis for imagining ourselves into the future. If we bring this insight from existential phenomenology together with this recent work in embodied cognition, 
it has a striking implication. The co coherence of a life, that is, our persistent identity through autobiographical time, seems to be built up from some very basic motor capacities. <clears throat> I think it's therefore not surprising that some of our best stories retell episodes from the road and often convey <clears throat> the contingency and adventure of exploration. To the extent we disburden ourselves of being mentally involved in our, in our own navigation and locomotion, we would seem to be embarking on quite a significant social experiment. The merits of such an experiment can be debated, but in any case it should be undertaken in full awareness that our mobility as self-directed embodied beings is fundamental to our nature as it has evolved over millions of years and the distinctly human experience of identity. <clears throat> Researchers have found that many traffic jams result from episodes of slight braking that propagate backwards and become full stoppages, initiated by someone's failure to drive smoothly. <clears throat> Smoothness could be defined as a driver keeping constant the t time gap that separates her from the car in front of her, which she does by attending to the cars yet further ahead. Often you're looking through the windshield of the car in front of you. It's small lapses of anticipation that cause most traffic jams, not crashes. The more we treat the road, the whole situation that is, as an object of joint attention, the better the experience. We're both together and very separate in our cars, so the road has an interesting hybrid quality to it, unlike any other shared space I can think of. It's thus a fertile setting for thinking about human sociality within the frame of an individualistic society. Um, I'm glad Garnett is here because I have this quote from some writer that he cited, uh, Michel de Certeau. Um, I never got quite the reference, so I'm going to get it from you later. He said, walkers are practitioners of the city, for the city is made to be walked. This could be said with equal justice of drivers, especially in a city such as Los Angeles that was made to be driven. On New Year's Eve of 2018, Pope Francis expressed the ethical significance of this in a homily at St. Peter's Basilica in which he praised drivers who, quote, <clears throat> move in traffic with good sense and prudence. Prudence is a capacity for judgment that we exercise when rules are inadequate to guide our behavior. It comes only from experience and is cultivated only when we are free to err. Uh, Francis said, these and a thousand other behaviors express concretely love for the city. In a beautiful phrase, Francis suggested that prudent drivers are, quote, artisans of the common good, who love their city not with words, but with deeds. From my own travel, some of the best urban drivers I've seen are in London. The give and take of the cabbies and commuters as they jostle to advance is a supple play of deference and assertion, professional courtesy and opportunities seized, that prizes traffic flow over rule following. Traffic flow is a shared good of an interesting sort. It's a fragile, emergent property of a collective, a state that happens only if everyone is paying attention to the situation and brings a disposition of flexibility to it. At times, it resembles an improvisation among musicians. Urban driving at its best is an experience of civic friendship, an act of trust and solidarity that makes one proud to belong to the human race. <clears throat> Some traffic situations are quite complex. No set of rules can fully specify what it is good to do in such situations beyond what you're allowed to do any more than the rules of football can fully capture what happens on the field in the course of any given game. Corollary to this, a traffic regime that is overly rule-bound becomes highly inefficient, 
as you've probably noticed while sitting at an empty intersection for minutes waiting to turn left. There have been labor actions in Europe where taxi drivers bring traffic to a standstill by following traffic rules to the letter <laughs> in the tradition of the work to rule strike in which workers take management at their word and act as though the rule book was adequate to describe what they do. The resulting paralysis brings into the foreground the role of unspecified customary practices to keep things moving. Any field of complex action relies on a variety of forms of normative prescription, some of which are tacit. <clears throat> this theoretical point has some application <clears throat> because rule following becomes a pretext for the transformation of law enforcement into a for-profit enterprise. And in fact, we've permitted ourselves to slide into an illiberal traffic regime of photo radar speed traps and red light cameras. This regime claims for itself the unassailable high ground of safety. But that claim is very shaky indeed, as I document in the book. I mean, it's, if you're, yeah. If you're not cynical enough, is all I can say, if, if you're <laughs> cynical about red light cameras. Those who invoke safety <clears throat> enjoy a nearly non-rebuttable presumption of public spiritedness. So a stated concern for safety becomes a curtain behind which various entities can collect rents from perfectly reasonable behavior. The trick to that is to formulate rules that are at odds with our natural reasonableness. That way you can guarantee a certain rate of infraction and therefore revenue. If one cares about safety, and who doesn't, one does well to take a skeptical look at the safety industrial complex and its reliance on moral intimidation to pursue ends other than safety. To do this thoroughly, one must venture beyond the mental universe of risk reduction altogether. That universe takes its bearings from the least competent among us. This is an e egalitarian principle that is entirely fitting in many settings, a touchstone of humane society that we rightly take pride in. One of the people closest to me is significantly disabled and I'm often moved with gratitude for the accommodations our society makes for her. But if left unchallenged, the pursuit of risk reduction tends to create a society based on an unrealistically low view of human capacities. Infantilization slips in under cover of democratic ideals. And in the book, I insist on the contrary, that democracy remains viable only if we're willing to extend to one another a presumption of individual competence. This is what social trust is based on, built on. Together, they're the minimal endowments for a free, responsible, fully awake people. If we're not following rules when we drive, what are we doing? The short answer <clears throat> is that we're engaged in an iterated process of mutual prediction, a kind of socially bootstrapped process uh, by which we make ourselves intelligible to one another. And I want to, this is a little bit geeky, but I, I want to go into this a little bit. <clears throat> There's an emerging paradigm in cognitive science according to which the human mind is fundamentally a prediction engine. And I think this is something social theorists will find interesting. So Andy Clark, who's really a great, if you, if, you, if you ever want to dip into cognitive science and are looking for something, anything by Andy Clark is a, is a good way to go. So in his uh, most recent book, he says, <clears throat> we see the world by, if you will, guessing the world, using the sensory signal to refine and nuance the guessing as we go along. For our purposes, I believe this explanatory framework of predictive processing can enhance our understanding of traffic. In part, it can do so by, by helping us build a bridge from the narrowly cognitive and physiological aspects of the traffic equation, for example, the reaction times of drivers, to the social dimension. 
If I'm on the, on the right track here, such an integration should yield a more holistic and therefore more realistic picture of what needs to be modeled by those who seek formal descriptions of traffic, usually for the sake of automating it or otherwise improving it. Minds reside in bodies and constantly move around. As we do so, we have expectations of what the world will present to us and continually refine these in light of incoming sense data. But we also move in such a way as to generate data for ourselves that will bear on the aptness of our current predictions. It's an iterated cycle in which action and perception are inseparably joined in a probabilistic reality grasping operation. Other people are doing the same. That's the key point. As Clark writes, this fact yields an opportunity. Perhaps our predictions of other agents can be informed by the very same generative model that structures our own patterns of action and response. We may sometimes grasp the intentions of other agents, this suggests, by deploying appropriately transformed versions of the multi-layered sets of expectations that underlie our own behavior. Other agents are thus treated as context nuanced versions of ourselves. These suggestions provide an evolutionary rationale for, eh, I'm going to skip that. Um, given that other agents are engaged in the same strategies of probabilistic reality grasping, we can help each other out. That is, our individual processing loads can be reduced when we exploit this commonality, letting others provide some external scaffolding for our grasp of the situation. Because others are themselves predictors, one sometimes gets into a loop of continuous reciprocal prediction that can be mutually beneficial, as in the case of a flowing, unregulated intersection in Rome or London. It can also spiral down into a case of mutual assured misunderstanding, as sometimes seems to be the case in an episode of road rage. So let's consider these in turn. When all goes well, the unregulated intersection resembles a lively conversation in its improvisational collaborative quality. Other nonverbal parallels to a conversation may be found in team sports and in mundane activities such as changing the bed sheets with a partner. In a conversation, each person uses her own facility with language to help predict the other's utterances while also using the out this is Clark, while also using the output of the other as a kind of external scaffolding for their own ongoing productions. All of this is probabilistic. There may be any number of paths the conversation could take. And in saying what to say next, you read the likelihood of the other person's possible responses in deciding how to proceed. Clark doesn't touch on the playful or humorous quality that the best conversations often have, which may depend on disrupting an interlocutor's expectations. But for our purposes, as an analog to coordination among drivers, his treatment of conversation serves well enough. He says that in a typical conversation, each party tries to match his or her behavior and expectations to those of the other. In part, we do this through imitation, which helps to support mutual prediction and mutual understanding. The result is that conversation may feel easy, despite its complexity. On the other hand, sometimes a conversation goes very badly. Your hypothesis that the other party is angry, for example, comes to control the actions by which you then probe the world for confirming evidence, scanning her face for signs of anger, tension in the body. These probings are not invisible to the other party and make her tense. This becomes a feedback loop that can spiral into self-fulfilling psychosocial knots and tangles, to use Clark's phrase. And in the book, I have a section on road rage that explores the communicative problem of trying to make yourself understood from within a vehicle. It's actually really interesting. 
As Clark notes, sometimes we constrain or artificially stabilize our own behavior in order to make ourselves more predictable to others. This is what good drivers do, I think. When changing lanes across two or more lanes at once, a driver who's aware of himself as an object for others will briefly signal, crisply move over one lane, cancel the signal, and then crisply execute the same sequence again. Doing so is an extra courtesy. It helps put others at ease. A good driving culture is one in which such practices uh, have become norms, guiding our social intercourse in unobtrusive ways. Such norms reduce uncertainty and make us more mutually predictable to one another. <clears throat> Note that the utility of the norm for guiding expectations derives from its dual nature as both a description of what is normally done and a prescription for what one does. Only if the norm carries some prescriptive force capable of mustering plays, praise and blame on its behalf will it persist in practice and thus serve as a description that captures actual behavior well enough that it can serve to anchor sound expectations. Autonomous cars face the same predictive problem as human drivers, except that they're subject to neither the benefits nor the hazards of being engaged in a socially bootstrapped interpretive process of mutual prediction. <clears throat> there are both upside efficiencies <clears throat> and downside risks to human drivers sharing the road guided only by their natural social cognitive capacities. How will this balance sheet, and therefore the relative attractiveness of automation, be affected by other features of the society? In particular, given the importance of social norms in facilitating mutual prediction by drivers, we need to consider the question of social cohesion. How much purchase do norms have on our behavior? And is this changing? A less sciencey way of putting the problem of mutual prediction would be to speak of social trust. Can I ask someone to get me a little more water? I'm, yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Okay. Social trust. So the Harvard sociologist Robert Putnam famously found that as diversity increases in a society, uh, there is, he says, less expectation that others, thank you, will cooperate to solve dilemmas of collective action. And this expectation is self-fulfilling. As a society becomes more diverse, people hunker down, that's his phrase, and become socially isolated. A lack of shared enculturation leads to a relative poverty of shared norms to guide behavior and, just as crucially, expectations of behavior. <clears throat> One wonders how considerations like these will play out in Germany especially, as the influx of immigrants from very different societies meets a society that prides itself on its driving. <clears throat> The absence of speed limits on the Autobahn, and therefore the enormous range of speeds, depends on a strong social compact. It's a marvel of mutual trust that's possible only with robust norms. Beneath the noisy debates over immigration, the fate of Autobahn culture may be taken as an index of Germany's success in assimilating its new peoples. One of the appeals of automation, then, is that it replaces social trust with machine-generated certainty. That's the bargain that's on offer. And I think it's in this vicinity <clears throat> that we should look if we want to understand why self-driving cars play prominent roles in several dystopian films including Blade Runner, Total Recall, Minority Report, and WALL-E. In these films, drivers have become passengers, 
and appear as a new class of administrative subjects to be managed. I use the word subject to mean both an object of rule and the type of person, the form of subjectivity, that is assumed or required by such rule and thereby brought into existence. A passenger is detached, isolated from others, whereas the give and take of urban driving is a realm of interaction that demands the skills of cooperation and improvisation. As such, driving is a form of organic civic life, and the disappearance of civic feeling is key to the dystopian mood of these films. Tocqueville suggested that the habits of se collective self-government are cultivated in practical activities that demand cooperation, and such habits are indispensable to democratic political culture. But from the perspective of a central power, whether governmental or techno-utopian, what is wanted is an idealized subject of a different sort, an asocial one who permits an atomized account of human beings to be operationalized. This subject resembles the narrator of the Iggy Pop song, The Passenger, who says, I am a passenger, I stay under glass. A society of such isolated subjects will be more efficiently and pliably administratable. I think it's significant that some of the recent protest movements began as automotive protests or have significant automotive manifestations. So the yellow vests, named for the safety vests all motorists are required to carry in France, brought paralysis to, to Paris and other major cities nearly every weekend from late 2017 through early 2019, precipitating a major crisis for Macron's government. It was prompted by a slight decrease in speed limits and a fuel tax. The most significant material damage done by the protesters has been to France's network of photo radar speed traps. So over 60% of them have been destroyed uh, as of, Jan of January 2019. I think I was just in France last week and they said it was closer to 80%, I think. It's the most significant material like vandalism sort of event, I think, in modern times, I think it's as someone said. Don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, maybe. So um, these, you know, the fuel tax and the re reduction in speed limits disproportionately affected the French equivalent of flyover country, or what the French geographer Christophe Guilly calls la France périphérique. Out in the hinterland, one must do a lot of driving. So these proposals touched on concrete interests. The interests of metropolitan professionals in finance, media, and academia, which is really the heart of Macron's base, tilt differently. They rely on the metro. And just as importantly, they inhabit a symbolic moral economy in which environmental virtue is crucial to the self-image of the class and one of its titles to rule. <clears throat> on, the <clears throat> on the other side of the channel, the mass protests of the London taxi drivers both expressed and contributed to the Brexit mood. So this was a fight for economic sovereignty by highly trained professionals, mostly indigenous, against the threat of dispossession by foreign ride-hailing firms that rely on map software, U.S. military satellites, and the indifferent subsistence drivers of the gig economy, people as lost in London as you or I. In the recent protests of the Germans against a proposed speed limit on the Autobahn, labor leaders put on their yellow vests as an explicit reference to their French counterparts in a rare expression of solidarity between the Hun and the Gaul. <laughs> this is intriguing, given that the Germans regard their Autobahn driving culture as something uniquely human. There are hints of a nascent nationalist international, if we may speak in riddles. And this new concern with sovereignty is showing up prominently in people's stance toward driving. 
The protests of the last few years have generally been regarded as the expression of economic grievances or as the eruption of a spirit of pure negation, a revolt of the public that is more nihilistic than principled. There is surely truth in these interpretations, but I want to consider a further possibility that these movements are partly a response, at once spirited and rational, to a creeping colonization of the space for individual judgment and collective self-determination. The spirit of administration seeks to make everything idiot-proof and pursues this by treating us like idiots. It's a presumption that tends to be self-fulfilling. We really do feel ourselves becoming dumber. Against such a backdrop, to drive is to exercise one's skill at being free. And I suspect that's why uh, many of us like to drive. So one theme that's emerged with force in, um, in the course of writing this book is that of self-government, broadly understood, both as an individual capacity for self-command and as a political dispensation. Thus, self-government might mean the ability to skillfully control one's car, the ability to temper one's impatience with other drivers, and the ability to keep one's attention directed to the road in the face of multiplying distractions, on the one hand. On the other hand, the question of self-government is implied in questions such as who gets to decide what sort of regime of mobility we will inhabit. These different scales on which we pose the question of self-government are surely interlocked or imply one another. For example, if we're so distracted behind the wheel that we're already driving as if our cars were self-driving. This suggests we need some benevolent entity to step in and save us from ourselves by automating a task we're no longer capable of doing for ourselves. In drawing a straight line from self-command to self-government in the political sense, I mean to claim the problem of driving for the liberal Republican tradition of political reflection. This tradition holds that a people worthy of democracy must be made up of individuals capable of governing their own behavior in the first place and have therefore earned their fellow citizens' trust. When you're leaned into a blind curve on a two-lane country road on a motorcycle, it becomes very clear that the road is a place of mutual trust. This is one of the most interesting things about it. Driving is thus ripe for the attention of political theorists who are interested in what a Republican social order looks like at the fine grain. Let's understand this fragile order while it still persists in such unobtrusive pockets of daily life as driving. Such pockets might hold clues that can guide our hopes for the renewal of social trust more broadly. Thank you. Space, that there are going to be some rule breakers. There are going to be people who flout the norms because they can and they assume they can get away with it. And the only thing that keeps us uh, straightforwardly calm behind the wheel, the nice Bruce Banner commuter who, who only occasionally morphs into the Incredible Hulk road rager, is the sense that someone at some point will have this enforcement mechanism brought down on them. So Convenient Cop actually captures that in real time. And uh, it shows you know, the people who, who take the emergency exit to pass everyone who's lined up carefully and politely to, to leave the freeway. And the comments are hilarious. And, and it, it expresses a deeply human recognition, not only of justice served immediately, uh, but of the compact that we've made, which is that we do not want 100% accurate enforcement because none of us would be able to pull out of our driveways without being ticketed for something. On the other hand, you want a human being to use his or her judgment when they do decide to enforce those rules. And those things are both at risk if we head down the path that I think Matt outlined um, so well. So what I want to do, is just, just briefly, is uh, discuss a few of the uh, tensions that I that I picked up on um, in, in Matt's paper, and then push back on two themes in particular, which um, he will then be responsible for answering when I'm done. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the tensions, I think, and the one that fascinates me the most is this idea of, as Matt put it, remaining human against technologies that tend to enervate or automate our decision making for us. And I think the, the contrast I kept seeing in many of the examples uh, was between comfortable passivity and a little slightly more risky autonomy. And I don't think we should discount that comfortable part because that is in fact one of the things that is, is potentially likely to allow us to slide a little more towards becoming Wally ectomorphs and, and rather than engaged uh, decision makers. I saw some tension between the idea of exploration and efficiency. You know, do we, do we have the time to explore places on the open road or are we more focused on finding the most efficient route from point A to point B? Um, trust versus regulation. And uh, the challenge of attention at a time when we expect convenience. So uh, one of the things I thought was great was this discussion of sort of creativity on the road, the kind of on the fly decision making that we have to we have to do on a constant basis. And, and most of us, if we've been driving for a long time, don't even think of, we just, we just do this. Um, and to contrast that kind of improvisational style of making our way through the world with Silicon Valley's idea of creativity, which is somewhat different. And I, was, I thought about graffiti, right? So there, there are plenty of folks in Silicon Valley who, who love the sort of audacity and the improvisational style of graffiti but they tend to like it if they've purchased it from Banksy and put it on the wall <laughs> of their corporate lunchroom. So I feel like this is the same kind of tension we see with, with um, driverless cars. But the two themes I want to push back on briefly, the first is safety. Um, and I am a, a skeptic of our, of our safety industrial complex. I, I remember strapping my kids into their first car seat. They're 13 now. So I was, I was that generation of parents. I grew up with no car seats. I mean, I remember log rolling in the back of my grandma's <laughs> station wagon as she went to the grocery store. Um, but by the time I had kids, it was the, the safety stuff was amazing. And you could probably have safely sent both of my kids to the moon and back in their car seats. I mean, they, they were indestructible. And I always felt that it was a little bit of uh, overkill. But um, I also subscribe, and I live in Washington, D.C., where traffic is challenging. Um, I subscribe to these automated updates about traffic and about accidents. And I've been, uh, to speak to James's point about language and how it in impacts our understanding of culture, I've been fascinated to see how these things are written. So I got one this morning when I was trying to figure out what time I should leave to avoid traffic that said Third Street Tunnel closed due to a motor vehicle crash. I was like, that's, so, that's a strange way of a motor vehicle crash. It just decided to, I mean, there's no human being there, right? The, the message itself is automated. It comes over via text. Um, the motor vehicle has crashed. So it's, there's a sort of passivity in even the way that this was described. Um, and I think this, this is where we're headed in terms of the safety industrial complex. But there's an element to it that that I'm sure you get into in the book that I just want to raise today and hopefully we can discuss, and that's the industry, the, the industry that creates our cars. Um, and I went back and, and looked through uh, comments about Ralph Nader's book, Unsafe at Any Speed. Do you remember this? This was a, this was a big moment in, in the history of uh, American consumer automobile relationships. Um, it was ostensibly about the dangers of the Chevrolet Corvair and other uh, fault a faulty design in automation that was, that was unnecessarily causing physical risk for drivers. But the language is all about the moral imperative to ensure safety. The language is heavily moral in its tone. The way Ralph Nader described it is, is quite moral. So although we talk about safety often, and certainly the automobile industry talks about safety in terms of practical design choices and reactions to crashes and how we can improve things, it's really a thinly veiled moral conversation we're having about our ability to uh, tolerate risk and to tolerate um, accidents and motor vehicle crashes. Um, and I think that this issue of safety speaks to the broader issue of trust that you raise. And that's because, think about the ongoing decline of trust in institutions, things like government, uh, corporations, um, schools, uh, the media, universities, uh, there, there's, uh, Pew has done excellent data, has excellent data on this uh, gradual decline of trust. So when we think about 
measuring our own safety as individuals and making choices about what we are and aren't willing to risk, we have to factor in the fact that this trust in things like corporations um, that manufacture the cars we drive in is not particularly high. And our trust in the government agencies that have been tasked with regulating those corporations and their guarantee of safety is also on the decline. So trust is not merely uh, individualized when we're on the road at any given moment, but there's a kind of broader social trust that has to do with institutions and how we understand their role in protecting us. And the question is, should we? Should we have that expectation? Or perhaps are we coming out of a period in our history where some cynicism about the ability of large institutions to keep us safe and, and, and free and healthy is, is <coughs> pendulum swinging back. So that's the, the safety question. Um, on, a, on, a, on a sort of individual note, I think people really, really value safety and even people who, like me, kind of scoff at some of the safety precautions that go on, safety really matters to people. So that it's a deeply emotional need that's being met when, when uh, we're promised greater safety. And I have friends who are Luddites and all other things, but when you tell them that they could strap their toddler into the back of a driverless car and send them, know that they will go from point A to point B safely and be picked up at the preschool, um, they think that's great. I don't have to worry about those, those other crazy drivers on the road who might harm them. So I think the power of that message is, is a real, poses a potential challenge to the self-reliance and the, the skills-based arguments that you're making. Um, the other uh, provocation I'll raise is this question of pleasure. How do we understand our relationships as individuals, as human beings, to the machines that we use? And I think you definitely are getting at that in your, in your work when you talk about the open road and exploring and, and not being burdened by overregulation or too much surveillance. Um, so I'll give you a little potted history that, that I think shows that this, our understanding of how our machines can bring us pleasure has changed pretty quickly over time. I came across an E.B. White quote where he was talking about uh, a Model T Ford. Um, and he said, I can still feel my old Ford nuzzling me at the curb as though looking for an apple in my pocket. He's talking about a car, but clearly he has an affection for this machine that has allowed him to do something that he couldn't do before. Flash forward to the, to the sort of early to mid 20th century and you've got Ralph Nader um, ushering in what you could call a kind of era of regulatory compliance. So machines are no longer a source <coughs> supposed to primarily be that nuzzling thing and a source of, of comfort, they, they can be that, but first they have to comply with this regulatory oversight, which speaks to safety. Safety begins to trump the pleasure of the automobile in, in um, serious ways, with one exception. If you're wealthy, you can purchase risk by buying a very fancy sports car, right? In a way that, a, that the average car driver doesn't get to have. Like you, if you have a need for speed, but you're middle class, you're not gonna get that Lamborghini and you're not gonna be able to purchase the space or the safety that you know a, an extremely expensive sports car can give you. Um, <coughs> today, I think Matt's absolutely correct that we are headed towards an era of passivity towards our machines. Um, the car is no longer as cool and nifty as it, as it used to be, right? We have the, these phones that we can carry around that take us immediately to other worlds. Um, so what I think we could see happening is what Matt noted, which is that there's this space opening up now in the automobile where if it's automated, suddenly you have what we were talking about with the average commuting time is what, like a, a little under an hour? 26 minutes in each direction. 26 minutes in each direction. And if you're a Silicon Valley engineer, you're thinking, that's attention, that's time, that's money. We can capture that and use it. Um, and so I think for if you have that mindset, driving is the distraction, right? Driving is the distraction from get, capturing people's attention to look at the things that you want them to see on the screen in front of them. Um, and I think this might speak a little bit to um, the shift in language I see where driving is now spoken more and more often is a burden. And you see this certainly in urban areas where the commuting time is, is, is constantly discussed. You know, in DC, people are saying, well, the average Washington DC commuting time is XYZ. The ranking of the worst traffic and the worst you know, commuting times. Um, a sense of 
we have a problem that we have to solve. It's a burden to get behind the wheel, rather than what it was even 50 years ago, which was a privilege and an adventure. Um, much of that is obviously the, the uh, fact that more and more people can drive because it's less uh, an elite uh, thing. But here too, even when it comes to passivity and it comes to uh, design choices, the cup holder to me, like the remote control did for television and in our relationship with, with screens in the home, the cup holder is the sort of the, the design choice that was the tipping point for me. Um, it's like when I, uh, Matt is correct that um, to look at something like driving because it's something we all do but nobody thinks enough, enough about, but we all remember a first car, I would think. I, I, I would guess most of you, or we all have very uh, strong memories of our childhood automobile experience. Um, but I remember the first time I got a car that had a cup holder, and I, and I did recognize this as something unusually empowering, um, but also potentially bad, right? I mean, it was, there was just something somewhat unnerving about the fact that some random engineer had realized that I really wanted a place to put my coffee when I was driving. So those tiny choices accumulate over time and help shape the culture of driving in a way that I think Matt's entirely right to, to question. Um, Finally, I just want to say uh, briefly one more thing about language. Uh, and you used all of these phrases interchangeably, but I think it's worth really questioning one in particular. We talk about self-driving cars. Can a car have a self? And I think this speaks in some ways to the issue of safety and convenience as well, because if a, and we've seen a few of these cases already, um, if a self-driving car kills a human being, who is at fault? These are the things that Wired Magazine has, you know, big think pieces about every other week. But it's a serious question, um, and I think the approach that Matt is taking is a much better way of getting at this, because it gets to the way that we understand what we are doing when we are doing it, and how we understand the motivations and the intent of everyone else around us. So I like um, driverless cars better, because that's a more accurate description of what these are. But self-driving cars is something that I think many of the designers of, of, of driverless cars like to use, because it, it returns a human element to something that they've just extracted mm -hmm. the human from. Um, same thing when you hear autonomous vehicles. That should be an oxymoron, <laughs> right? <laughs> The vehicle does not have a will for which it can use, you know, uh, make autonomous choices, and yet we're using that language in discussing this. Um, finally, I'll say uh, two little just asides. One is that I think when you when your subtitle includes the word the phrase "open road" and you talk about the behavioral choices that people are making on the road, and I think it's it's also helpful. And again, we're back to Reddit and convenient cop, also instant karma, very satisfying, but. The road is also a stage, right? It's like a theater. And if you think about some of the great uh, sociologists who have studied uh, how we behave and perform our roles in public space, is, this is an extremely fruitful place to do it. Because as you say, you're in, and especially as cameras and dash cams and whatnot become more common, we are all performing our own role, but we're also surveilling the performances of others and then potentially using them to justify the fact that their insurance company should pay for the accident that they caused. Um, and then the future, kids. Because we do know from some various surveys that uh, younger generations are less interested in getting driver's licenses. They're less interested in owning their own car. And I think ownership is another theme here that is changing. We see with the rise of, of you know, ride sharing, and at least in DC we have car to go which I think should just be called death trap. Have you guys seen these car to goes They look like a shoe. They're tiny, there's no back seat, and people rent them and drive like maniacs and, and Accidents. One went down a one-way street near my house the other day, and it really is this uh, tiny little menace. Um, <laughs> but they don't have the same connection and, and experience with the machine that many of us did. I grew up in the kind of suburban Florida, and getting your driver's license and scraping together enough money from your bad uh, movie theater job, just theoretically, <laughs> to buy a crappy old used car that could get you just around town was so liberating. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us in this room understand that feeling when I say it, but there's an entire generation that goes, that's crazy, right? They say, first of all, it's environmentally destructive, it's wasteful, you, can, you, know, you only use that car two hours a day, it sits idle the rest of the time. But there's a human feeling that's being expressed by that, that understanding when everybody nodded their head 
that won't necessarily pass on generation to generation if we don't ask these very important questions that matter.